think this highly depends on your use case, on your customers. What do they expect? What's your development team like? Can you afford a native app? I mean, if you have a team of 10 native developers, then yeah, great. Just build native apps. It's going to always be the best. But to save cost and money, there are different approaches. And I would give everyone the advice. Just create some projects to get used to it and see what the outcome looks like. Uh, and you're definitely going to be surprised how far we've come with cross-platform development. Hey, this is Brian, and you're listening to Jamstack Radio, a bi-weekly series where we discuss modern web development with maintainers, founders, and developers. Jamstack Radio is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter, at Jamstack Radio. Welcome to another installment of Jamstack Radio. On the line, we got Simon Grimm. Simon, welcome. Thanks for having me, and glad to be here. Yeah, pleasure. You're like our, our second guest uh, back-to-back from Germany, too, as well. I just realized that uh, when when you said that earlier. But um, yeah, recently just had the uh, creator of Superstarter on talking about his project. Yeah, it's it's funny. You have talked more to him than I am, but I think I just live like a few kilometers from him, so I still need to reach out. So, Johannes, if you're listening, I'm going to get in contact soon. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, so Simon, uh, do you want to tell the, the listeners who you are and, and what you do? Sure, sure. So uh, I've been a web and mobile developer for the past like eight years. And I started becoming a blogger in 2014. I settled on a framework back then. I wrote about it and I quickly became uh, like the known person and expert in that space for a framework called Ionic, uh, which we're definitely going to talk more about later. And yeah, over the last seven, eight years, this has grown into like my own little business since uh, so for the last six years, I'm self-employed. I run the Ionic Academy, which is an online school focus on Ionic. So every month I release new courses and tutorials around Ionic. And yes, you can believe there's always something new because versions keep changing in the web development world. <laughs> there's always something to update or new to talk about. And since uh, start of this year, I also run a second platform called galaxies.dev. Uh, where my focus is on everything beyond Ionic and especially React Native, uh, simply because I, I just love all the cross-platform development aspects. I tried doing native development, but I'm so much into all the cross-platform stuff and the intersection of web and mobile and how web developers can build mobile apps and what you need to watch out for in mobile that it just makes totally sense. And next to that, I run a YouTube channel. I crossed 50,000 subscribers this year. And I also do podcasting with my co-host at All The Code Podcast. So we talk about All The Code on there. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Perfect. I've not seen your content until you until you reached out. I was not aware of you. But this is like kind of reminiscent to when I talked to Scott Tillinski a couple of years ago. It was like around the time that Syntex FM had just started. And he kind of gave us like the sort of behind the scenes of how we started on YouTube, how we created the um, Level Up Tuts um, courses. And now they just recently were acquired into Century as well, which is pretty cool for them. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious uh, in your sort of trajectory and your background, like what made you want to make the jump from like you're still a developer, but like to educator? Yeah. So, so first of all, I just honestly, I just got goosebumps when you said it, it, it sounds like Scott Tilinski because all, the whole time, like the last one, two, three years, I, you try to look up for mentors and I try kind of looked at what Scott's doing and I think he's doing a great job. So yeah, I just got goosebumps when you said that. So I started out of university actually as a native mobile developer uh, at a company, which was kind of fun. But on my commute, I always listened to uh, like the Smart Passive Income podcast and that stuff. And, and somehow that got me hooked on the idea of hey, you want to create your own thing? And uh, then I started this blog really without really having the intention to actually like make this something. Uh, that was in 2014 when everyone was saying, hey, blogging is dead. Blogging was five years ago. Cool. But hey, guess what? It was still cool. And I just quickly noticed in the company or after a few years that this isn't really for me. Like I, I do like to program and, and like coding, but there's so many other things I'm also interested in. Like Content creation and writing, that was kind of fun, like trying out new technologies, creating YouTube videos. And then even like after two, three years of blogging, you got to wear like a lot of different hats. You got to do content marketing. You got to be on Twitter. You got to write emails. You got to write sales pages. And you got to think about so many more things that you just usually don't 
or can't do when you're employed as a developer. So I think back then there was a term like multi-potential and I felt like, yeah, I, I just like to wear all the different hats and it's fun to code on Monday, write marketing emails on Tuesday, have sales calls on Wednesdays and live my life just on my own terms. <laughs> yeah. And it, how many years have you been doing this um, educator, uh, developer educator sort of content creation? So I started the blog in 2014, so that has to be nine years. I don't know exactly. Around that time, probably a year later or so, I started the YouTube channel. Uh, you can still find my early videos, which are kind of embarrassing looking back on them. But that's actually a good sign that I started at the right time. If, you, if you're not embarrassed, you're, you, haven't, you haven't made enough progress. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, so I've been at this quite for quite long. But honestly, it's, it's not really a great indie creator. Like I've seen... Uh, other content creators come up just during the COVID pandemic and they had like a spike of subscribers. Like they went from zero to 200,000 on YouTube in a year. And uh, meanwhile, I'm just grinding along for eight years and, and just crossed 50,000. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, I'm here for the slow uh, and the long-term game. Yeah, I mean, the, the slow long-term is, it is also sustainable. And like, I, I definitely have noticed uh, a couple folks here. Uh, well, I say folks here, I like, person that comes to mind is Theo. Uh, Theo, I consider a friend. He's out here in San Francisco. Uh, and he went from zero to, I, I guess, almost 100, maybe 100. I don't, I'm not even sure where, where he's at. I guess more. more. Or not. Yeah. And it's uh, his, his style is like he definitely has a style. He's unique. He's unique. Yeah, yeah. very unique and uh, was able to grow an audience based on that, but also came out of Twitch and understands the sort of content creation and that sort of influencer marketing piece as well. It, it's the same for the primer gene. Like yeah. these people, they just have strong opinions. They have strong visuals and they're just unique beings. Same basically also for West Boss. You just, you hear the voice and you know, okay, this is West Boss. Yeah. Um, they're just a few people in, in the space and you just immediately know who, who's talking. Yeah. It, it's interesting because like the like Prime is a, another person who I, so I started live streaming around the same time Prime did. Uh, and we both had like the very similar, like um, less than 50 concurrent streamers and, sort of dabbled in YouTube. And I think when he switched to a YouTube focus, that's where he saw a lot of his growth. But yeah, we could, we could talk like Ignazium to about this content creation <laughs> game. Cause I, I think it's, there's a lot of value in kind of figuring out how to build that repeatable cycle. And you mentioned smart passive income. Like I'm familiar with, with that guy as well from like his early days. I, I might've like stumbled on his, his YouTube. Yeah. But I think it, it really comes down to consistency. And you had mentioned like you, your segment, your days where, Maybe you have a sales day and maybe you have a marketing day. I found me personally having structure in how I approach even running a company or even when I was doing DevRel, like having structure where like I code on Fridays makes it easier to come back and be consistent, uh, even if it's only one day. Um, but I'm curious, um, you mentioned you're part of the Ionic community and you have the Ionic course and, and, and series. Are you connected with the like the company? Like, Do you show up at their, their meetups or... To what extent do you have connections to the community while you're creating this content? I do have pretty good connections to them. I always uh, kept talking to the CEO on Slack and I can always DM them and they just basically immediately reply to me. But I've been never really part of the Ionic company, nor have I actually met a single person from them because I'm, I'm here in Germany. I'm, I haven't been to a lot of conferences, to be honest. So maybe this is going to change next year. Ionic is from medicine in the United States, and uh, I'm not the biggest fan of flying, so <laughs> there are a few barriers between me and Ionic, but we do have uh, active interactions, and actually since this year, we do have a little agreement that I create some content for them, so this is a pretty pretty nice deal we, f we figured out after, but this took us like many, many years. Yeah, you just kept showing up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just consistently kept showing up. To, to be honest, I sometimes hear this from other content creators that when they're free, when they're self-employed, they don't know how to do stuff. Like some days they're just, I don't know, playing Zelda the whole day. To be honest, this didn't happen for me in the last five years. I am i don't know why, but I keep having my own plan. I go to work in the morning, uh, like here in my room, in our home. And that's basically never a day where it just slack off. I mean, if I'm sick, never getting sick, I take the time off. But otherwise, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty self-motivated. I think I never missed a newsletter or Tuesday tutorial release in the last four or five years. So uh, there's a new tutorial basically every week. And yeah, that speaks to the consistency of uh, my approach. Again, it's probably not the best. Others are growing faster, but you can always compare to others. And I'm, I'm happy with how things are right now. 
That's awesome. Yeah. I So I've always been like a write blog post and podcasting. So this podcast has been around for a while, but I never did video outside of like tutorials where I didn't show my face, uh, essentially, like for like solving a problem at work and stuff like that. But it was the cadence of like setting yourself up for consistent like wins. Like I also started a newsletter as well during the pandemic. I found so much reward and value to be like, oh, I've got a thing to do. What have I done in the last week? Let me put in the newsletter. Yeah. Extremely rewarding. But I wanted to uh, move into like some of the other stuff that you're working on. She mentioned galaxies.dev. And then it's like Dev Attic. Is Dev Attic like the umbrella for all the stuff that you're doing? Or what's, what is Dev Attic? Yeah, actually, before we forgot a D in that document, so it's Dev Dactic. <laughs> Dev Dactic, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's anyway just a, just a random name. Uh, a friend of mine bought that domain eight years ago, and then I started logging, and he gave it to me. Like it, it pretty much like it has a relevance to Dev, so development and didactic, which is like teaching the stuff to yourself. Uh, so I figured this out afterwards. Okay, <laughs> that's basically the platform I started blogging on. Uh, and where I built up basically my community, I grew a newsletter on there and I just published uh, all my stuff. In the in the beginning, it was actually a bit scattered, like all over the place, like CSS and web stuff. But I quickly noticed back then in 2015, I think, that people enjoyed most when I created Ionic Tutorials because it was back then a pretty new framework. And that's usually the chance to, I mean, in in hindsight, I know why I kind of became successful because I was the first to write about it and uh, I did everything right that the gurus usually tell you, like pick a niche, write about it, become the expert. But I didn't really understood like until I was four years in or so that people considered me an expert on the topic and I never really felt like an expert in Ionic and I still honestly to this day, I mean, I pretty much know every Ionic component and all the properties you can use and, and everything that's available and their services and how the whole Ionic universe works together. But there are people a lot better at Angular or people a lot better at React. And that's what's essential as well to build Ionic applications. So even to this date, yeah, I accept I'm an expert in the Ionic framework itself, but uh, not really beyond it. Okay, cool. So galaxies.dev, that is, you mentioned it's React Native, but is it is it broader than just React Native? Yeah. So the whole idea started last year uh, simply because I was like, I've been doing Ionic Angular for seven years. And at some point, you just, you just want to look outside the bubble and just see what's going on. Also, because I noticed React is in the JavaScript world, the biggest thing, it's not Angular. Although we must say this year, Angular it's going strong for Angular, isn't it? Like the V16 release? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of new things, yeah. Uh, there's a whole lot going on. I mean, it's not shifting the tides to Angular. The React community is just too big at this point, I think. But there's a whole lot going on in the Angular world that makes it feel like a really fresh breath of air. So last year, I was just, I just want to do something else. And I felt like Ionic Academy is not the place to post Flutter content or to post React Native content. And so I thought, well... If I want to expand, if I want to grow, if I want to get YouTube bigger, I just have to get into other content as well. Like I'm serving this niche of Ionic people completely great. Like everyone who's getting in touch with Ionic will definitely run across one of my tutorials. It's just no chance that they Google something and never see me. It's it's impossible. Yeah. So I wanted to build up this own platform also because Ionic Academy was built with WordPress. I mean, nothing against WordPress. And it just worked great for a membership site, but I wanted more control. So we set up this project. I actually hired a designer for this. I hired an additional developer and we created this whole project from the ground up with new designs, with this whole branding around galaxies and the galactic theming. It is built with SwelteKit and Superbase as the backend. So it's a pretty modern stack right now. And I launched it earlier this year with the focus on like all things web, like cutting edge web technology. And I found this to be interesting, but the problem is that it didn't really get like product market fit or whatever you want to call this, because people usually want to learn just one topic. Like they want to learn React or they want to learn Next. They don't want to learn quick today and tomorrow Flutter and three days later Gatsby. That's just not the reality of how the world works. Yeah, And so... I reconsidered, like I still love the platform and the branding of the platform. And what's closest to me is actually cross-platform development. And um, that's what I love. I love building mobile applications from web technologies. And so I could decide between Flutter and React Native. And currently I enjoy React Native the most. 
And so I decided that my main focus for the next time is going to be Galaxies uh, for React Native. There's also a dedicated landing page for everyone interested at galaxies.dev slash React Native, where you can sign up. And that's probably also becoming the main main thing of Galaxies. But because it's like a like a brand, it's not the React Native Academy. It could become anything. Like if I enjoy this a lot in three years, there could be Flutter content and there could be other course creators publishing content on Galaxies as well. That's That's ultimately my plan for it. Yeah, it's interesting that you went to the exploration and found out the sort of product market fit. Um, if you like course content learner fit or whatever, but uh, <laughs> I guess uh, that's a really good um, insight as well because I think like the Ionic Academy makes sense because like if I want to learn Ionic really quickly because I need to like solve a problem or I'm about to start a new job, like I will definitely go there. I guess the multi course language things. I tend to not sign up. Like I, I signed up to a level of tuts and like egghead. And I definitely have like got enough content out of there where I, I no longer subscribe. But like with things like a lot of Ken C dot courses, I think I, I get a lot of value out of because I just pay for that course. Mm. And then I go through it. And then if I have to go back, like Kent will send updates to it every like pretty consistently for like the first couple years. And I get a lot of value out of that. So I, I, I talked to Scott Talinsky. I mentioned the podcast that I had a couple of years ago. We talked a lot offline about course creation. And I ended up creating a course for Level Up Tuts as well a couple of years ago. And uh, I really enjoyed the experience, which was uh, about getting into Git and GitHub. Uh, and it was something that it's one of those things where you just you use all the time, but you don't know what you know. And then when you go do the course, you're like, oh, I know what it's like to be a big beginner again. Like mm-hmm. I, get, I get to slow down and take a step to like explain things and like explain how things go. And I found this extremely rewarding to do that. I'd, I would love to do like another course, just pick a topic that I, I feel like I, I am too good at and slow down and, and start writing out like the sort of early steps of it. And I don't know, do you get that same experience when you, I don't know if you go back to the, the beginner Ionic stuff. Uh, but maybe you get that with the React Native stuff now. Yeah. Uh, if you ever want to do a course, galaxies.dev is open for you. Uh, we're all going for you. And yeah, I, I 100% feel this right now. So this was actually very challenging over the last couple of weeks when, when I figured out that Galaxies isn't working. So I was worrying about this a lot because I really invested a lot of money into the development and the branding and the platform just didn't work out. And so I was reconsidering, what did I do wrong? Uh, do I actually enjoy all of this? Like I tried to follow with all the web development news for like six, nine months. And honestly, after nine months, I already felt like I burned out on it. There's just so much going on. If you focus like, oh, quick release. Oh, this release. Oh, that release. Oh, Vercel released something. Oh, there's a new Tailwind CSS5 that I'm going to pick up. And there's just so much going on. And um right now with my new focus on Ionic and, and React Native, it feels like, it feels basically like coming home. So I get started with React Native. Um, I create cool stuff that I already know people love and usually like because I, I know my, from my tutorials on, on YouTube what's popular. There's like a handful of topics that is basically always popular. That's like user authentication. How do I upload an image? How do I uh, make API calls? Uh, how does navigation and routing work? How do I pass around parameters in my application? Like all these basic essential things, push notifications, local notifications, SQLite, storage. I can just learn all of this with React Native and I immediately try to put this into videos right now. And I don't know what I don't know. So <laughs> my React skills and React Native skills going to be limited. Uh, and they're probably like if Ken C. Dots would look at my videos, he was saying, oh God, what was Simon doing? This is horrible. But there's a level of like the code gets the job done. And most of the time it just it's just enough to, first of all, get a first impression how it works. And then later you can still fine tune it. Uh, and I'm I'm lucky that I don't worry too much about what I do wrong or if I say something wrong about use state or use effect or whatever. I, I just don't care, to be honest. Yeah. I, I, to be fair, I would say Kent probably would not look at your course and be like, what's going on here? <laughs> He's a super empathetic guy. <laughs> I, I did want to ask a question about, okay, 2023, a cross-platform web development. You, you're now jumping in the React Native. Like, is there still... I, I feel like a couple of years ago, like Swift UI kit was like, no longer need to use Ionic or React Native. And that doesn't seem like that was true. It seems like that things just continue to get better. And then also I look at things like Expo. Like Expo has like come a long way. 
to give you like a really good experience. And there's like a couple other tools like Expo that are coming out. Yeah. So like if I want to build a mobile app today, what's your opinionated <laughs> response? <laughs> yeah. So so they're basically in my eyes, three the three biggest contestors in the space are Flutter, React Native, and Capacitor. So Capacitor is most likely the the unknown here of, of the three. Everybody knows about Flutter from Google and React Native from Meta. But Capacitor is from the Ionic company, and some people refer Ionic with Capacitor. Actually, you can throw in Capacitor in any kind of web project. So if you just have a React web application, you can install Capacitor and build a native mobile app from your code base. It's really like this takes 10 minutes, and people are shocked how easy this is actually. Because Capacitor will basically wrap your web application in a native container and create the Android Studio and iOS project. And then you can run it on a device and it's a native application. And Ionic is just the UI on top of this, which makes your application really feel, look and feel native. So you usually get the best experience if you use Ionic with Capacitor and then just select Angular, React, or Vue, or whatever JavaScript framework you prefer. However, there's a limitation of these applications. They always run in a web view. And that's always been what people say about hybrid applications or cross-platform applications, whatever you want to call them. Um, you're a bit limited because you run in a web view. I mean, some uh, animations or stuff just won't be as native as it could be because you're limited by the web browser. However, there are like so many cases where this doesn't matter. All the internal business tools they can benefit so much from just people who understand JavaScript and the web also writing their uh, native applications for internal tools. Um, Ionic has tons of enterprise customers, for example. So, And I've also built Ionic applications for the App Store. And uh, you've probably used some, like you usually don't notice a difference. However, uh, with React Native, it's a bit different. Um, I feel React Native is in the center. Like React Native is the best of both worlds. So Capacitor is webish like Then we got React Native in the middle, uh, which is still a bit web-like, but more native-like. The output is feels already really native, but especially with the stuff that Expo is doing. So I've been in contact with the Expo team and checked out the uh, AppJS conference recently and what they announced. Basically, Expo is bringing the web back into React Native. So it's interesting. <laughs> Initially, we had React Native, which was made for iOS and Android after we had React for the web. And now we're going back from React Native to the web. So they're adding a file-based routing to React Native. Um, they add SEO text. So you can build your React Native application and also make it available for the web with an export, which is quite interesting. And I think uh, this is, approach is going to be awesome. So the output of React Native feels definitely m more native uh, usually, but you got to... Uh, yeah, opt into the downsides of React. Like there are tons of packages. There's no defined UI. I just made a video about like the nine most popular React native UI libraries <laughs> because like, I just couldn't find what I should use. Should I use native base, React native paper, Tamagui? Everyone's just coming up with a new UI library. <laughs> so you, you got all of this. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I think is Flutter. And Flutter is interesting because it's Dart, so it's not really for the usual or typical web developer because web developers know JavaScript in, in general. And for Flutter, you need to understand Dart. I mean, if you got like five years of experience developing, it doesn't really matter. Like every language has a for loop and an if and an else and just a bit of other stuff. But it's different. And I think Flutter is a lot more than uh, Swift UI. So building your UI is not about diff elements and flex and feeling like an, a Bob Ross artist and like putting together the elements. No, Flutter, Flutter is like more the German approach. Here, this <laughs> widget, this widget, this widget, this widget. <laughs> it's like you just constantly build this tree of widgets and you feel like a machine putting this together. But to be honest, the output is really, really great. Like what, what you get, I mean, it's actually not a native application. They just render everything with the Skya engine and, and draw every pixel on the screen, but it looks perfectly native and they have tons of components built into this. So this feels more like Swift UI because you got this library of tools available. So coming back to what's the best, there is really no best. People want to know this all the time. And yeah, pro probably I took a stance for this and then I would be more popular because I know Theo, for example, like said, never use Flutter. You you should never use Flutter because they have no code push. And I'm like, yeah, but like some companies don't need code push and then Flutter is actually great. So I think this highly depends on your use case, on your customers. What do they expect? 
Uh, what's your development team like? Can you afford a native app? I mean, if you have a team of 10 native developers, then yeah, great. Just build native apps. It's going to always be the best. But yeah. um, to save cost and money, there are different approaches. And these three uh, are usually all great. Uh, and I would just uh, give everyone the advice, just create some projects to get used to it and see what the outcome looks like. Uh, and you're definitely going to be surprised how far we've come with cross-platform development in, in 2023. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it depends. It's like the, <laughs> the, the, the standard answer is it depends. And it, it's true because like I think when React Native was getting, I, I don't think Airbnb is still on React Native, but when it was kind of really getting popular, Airbnb took React Native to like an, another level. I mean, it kind of broke everyone's brain when it came to like iOS and mobile apps where mobile apps all had the same drop downs, the same interactions. And Airbnb is like, no, we're just going to design a beautiful experience on the phone. And it changed how people even approach like, oh, wow, we don't have to use like standard iOS elements to make an iOS app. We can do whatever we want. And I think the again, like, um, well, I say again, because we were talking before we hit record, but I was saying the rising tide raises all boats uh, when it comes to comparing technologies. But I'll say that for the listeners so they have it in the recording. But yeah, I, I find like this is a, a pretty enlightening conversation. I'm, I'm excited to thumb through some of your your course material, especially the React Native stuff. I've been um, pretty far removed from doing mobile apps for a while. <laughs> I built a mobile app when I worked at um, Netlify that never shipped. That was a, a fun little side project. I just like took my Fridays and built a React Native app to look at you deploys. I have a feeling I'll be building a mobile app pretty soon for for open source. And we've been looking at... Uh, well, I've been looking at React Native because that's like... Uh, I did a lot of Swift and, and Objective-C back in the day, but I'm a, I'm a web developer at this point, so uh, <laughs> I wouldn't mind having the same mental model to be able to build stuff. Yeah, I think it's just an awesome skill uh, to have as a web developer to just be able to build native apps. And uh, I'm now my my daughter is turning five this year, and I'm looking forward to creating some cool little iPad games for her uh, very soon uh, if she got a crazy idea. Nice, excellent. Yeah, my son is nine, and we did do some uh like javascript games uh, a couple like i think last summer just a couple tutorials to kind of show them like the basics maybe this summer we end up going a little little deeper <laughs> little boot camp yeah cool so um uh, appreciate the conversation i do want to transition us to picks uh so there's things that are, we're jamming on could be music food uh, could be fun games tech related all all above uh it all works and if you don't mind i'll go first Sure. So my first pick is the Super Mario movie. I got a chance to to watch this in the Grand Lake Theater here in Oakland. Uh, it's a great it's a great theater. It's a very old, but got a Sunday matinee with the kids and we watched it. And then just yesterday, it showed up on Amazon Prime for purchase. So I was like, oh, let's just go for it. Uh, so we watched it twice yesterday. <laughs> the kids watched it once without me, and then we watched it again before bedtime. It's a great movie. Like. I think there's a lot of questions around Chris Pratt being Mario and the choice of voice actors, but I, I think they did a good job with that where you didn't feel like Chris Pratt was playing Mario or Jack Black was playing Bowser. Well, there's some scenes where you know it's Jack Black, but uh, yeah, I thought they did a great job and they kind of pulled in all the elements that we all love to see when we were kids playing the games they put in the movie. So there's a lot of Easter eggs as well. The good thing is in Germany, it's always like the German voice anyway, so I don't really know the original <laughs> voice. Uh, but I saw I saw the poster of this uh, when we were to the cinema as well. Um, excited. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's it's definitely fun. Uh, if you ever played any Mario games uh, growing up, uh, there's a lot of them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they just had a lot of elements. I think a lot of like the, the Mario Kart scenes were kind of like ham-fisted in. Like it just felt like... Of course you're doing this, mm -hmm. but yeah, nostalgic. Yeah. It was just basically that through and through. So I can't imagine they don't do a second one. Like this is, this seems like a cash cow for sure. Awesome. I do have a second pick, which is a plane.com. So P L A I N, which is kind of weird to see a, a .com for so short uh, for a, a new project. I don't know if they like renamed or whatever, but if you ever use like intercom or Zendesk for live chat, this is that too as well. And I think one of the coolest features that I've seen so far is that I, what honestly, I haven't actually set up live chat for or any sort of support tools myself, but this was pretty easy. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward to set up like uh, help at open source email and then point that to your live chat. So that way, 
every email that goes to your help email goes directly to an interface where you could do support tickets. So I, the goal is basically have interns and operations staffs all be able to answer questions about whatever about the project. And um, this is probably one of the easier setups I've, I've done <laughs> to, to set up a live interaction uh, chat bubble. So definitely check it out, plain.com, P-L-A-I-N. Looks good. Yeah. Uh, so it's my turn, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to first pick something I'm, I'm probably pretty late to. So just the other week, I uh, got started with GitHub Copilot in my code, and it's been amazing. Like everyone's been talking about this, I think, since like December or so. Uh, I don't know when, when Copilot actually started. Uh, so I just installed it a few weeks ago, I think, too. And it's just amazing. Like what, what in terms of code generation, it's even... Uh, I'm, I'm doing some writing for Galaxies, which is based on Markdown files as well. And if I put like my what this is about in the title and description, like the post writes itself basically. Copilot gives me every single line. I usually put in all the code blocks that I want to write about in a tutorial, and then just Copilot knows everything. But also for for coding, uh, for some stuff, it's just amazing if you like have some some default stuff where you want to iterate over a map and create elements like copilot just knows that other people have done this and how firebase functions work and now you're going to call them it's only like only if the stuff is very new it's not working very well yet and uh, i'm really looking forward to copilot x uh, so i can stay in my ide and not go to chat gpt and ask it for coding advice but just do the conversation in my project and Copilot already knows about the code, but it, honestly, it's it's already worth every dollar you gotta spend on it if you're allowed to use it. Yeah, yeah, that's a, the check check with your uh, your security professionals at your company. Have you uh, applied for Copilot for uh, Copilot X yet? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I submitted my email to say, "Hey, give me access," and I'm still waiting. So, <laughs> uh, looking looking forward to. <laughs> Yeah, they also like a CLI thing coming up, right? GitHub AI CLI. That also looked amazing. I've seen a, a preview on Colby Fayot's channel. Yeah, so I do have access to that one. Oh, so nice. That's, it is pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So like, it's a team at GitHub called GitHub Next, and they just do a bunch of Skunk Works projects to do random stuff. So Copilot came out of this team originally a couple years, summers ago. And yeah, they're just like trying cool things. It seems like everything's going to be AI-focused. I was actually super interested in the GitHub Blocks feature, which I have access to as well, but I felt that the feature was a little clunky, so I, I, I didn't really know what to do with it. I had a lot of promise, but yeah, Copilot X uh, would love access. Uh, I need to ping my GitHub contacts. Please, please let me have access. <laughs> me, me too, please. <laughs> Um, so my second pick is a game, actually, or actually it's a game company, so I'm just going to pick Supercell here. There's a reason. So I like to play a casual mobile game and I'm constantly looking for good games. And to be honest, I don't know if my, if I just need better quality games or if I just want to have games from the nineties, like Age of Empires on my, but I just can't find games that really satisfy me anymore. I play stuff for a few weeks or two months and then I'm like, eh, this is boring. I just want my money. I'm just going to go. And just yesterday I just installed my favorite games again, which are Clash of Clans and Clash Royale. And it's just what Supercell is creating. I've played basically every Supercell game. They also have Heyday. I've played this farm with my my friends and my family for years, really. For years we've been playing Heyday. And it's just always been fun. Now I come back to Clash of Clans. It just looks great. Clash Royale, the same. Uh, only problem with that is it's too competitive for me. So um, once I lost like five or six times in a row and I, I took my phone and I actually destroyed the camera by biting into my phone. <laughs> Uh, and then, then I also lived in fear for three days that I've eaten some, some broken glass and that I would die. So I'm, I'm very, uh, <laughs> all right. Time for a break. <laughs> yeah. I can't recommend that. Uh, so if you're not into competitive playing, don't check it out. But, uh, honestly, if you want just high quality mobile games that you can casually play, Supercell is just the studio to look for. Uh, they got like four or five games and they announced a few others, uh, which they still haven't released as far as I know, but, Usually there should be something in it for you if you just uh, want to have a casual player, which at some point in your life, I mean, you just become a casual player and <laughs> just play for five minutes here and there. Amazing. Yeah, I've definitely clashed the clans like, a while ago, but I, I didn't get into it. But also, I do know my limit for competitive gaming. I'm more of a... I'd rather go play Tomb Raider 
like <laughs> by myself or like The Last of Us or something like that. Like stories are my type of gaming. Competitiveness makes it way too intense. And yeah. uh, I, I, my palms get sweaty. I mean, that's a cool thing about by the heyday or stuff like that. Like you just you go to your farm and you exactly. feed the animals that's, that's and you make some bread. It's like <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. And now, now I'm going to be tempted to like download this. I always heyday because I didn't know they had that game out. But yeah, now I'm tempted to go download a new a new iPad game and uh, just have at it at this point. Uh, hope you hope you enjoy it. But with that, Simon, thanks for the, the conversation, folks. Check out galaxies.dev and keep an eye out for the React Native content. Uh, but also, if you've been willing, uh, if you've wanted to get into Ionic content, obviously there's uh, a whole plethora uh, of content out there for you. So check it out and listeners keep spreading the jam. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. This show is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor and developer for startups. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. 